Are you seeing amazing. that jacket at all? Um, you could just drape it over that um, thing next to the drumsticks. There we go. Hello everybody and welcome to the Legends Interview Series. I'm Sarah Faruya from Sarah Faruya Coaching and I believe there are many, many ways to lead a life. We welcome a man who appeared in the world on the first day of the 1950s in Mayfair in London. He then went on to become an amazing pianist as a child and followed his love affair with music till he became part of a band called The Love Affair which had a number one hit with the song Everlasting Love. He then went on to join a band called Mott the Hoople, a legendary band who had an enormous hit with all the young dudes and who were supported by Queen. He's jammed with R.E.M., worked with Yoko Ono, and he now lives in Tokyo. Now he has the fantastic Morgan's Organ concert in this his studio, his home studio. So please, everybody, please welcome Mr. Morgan Fisher. All right, Sarah. All right. Welcome to my studio. Thank you so much for having I've, us. I've got a new mascot just in case I get too embarrassed. Oh. <laughs> All right, Ducky. <laughs> All right, Duck. <laughs> All right, Duck. <laughs> well, you said I was born in Mayfair, which sounds terribly posh, but just that's where the hospital happened to be. Yeah. Within a few days, I'd moved to Morris Diggs and my parents had, which were next to Baker Street, but uh, that sounds posh too, but not in those days. Yes. 1950, Baker Street was bombed out slum, basically. Mm -hmm. It was only five years after the war. And we only stayed there two years, so I've got no memories of that at all. Mm -hmm. But what I do have memories of is the next place we moved in, which was St John's Wood, mm -hmm. which is also now extremely posh and expensive. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> those days, again, a bombed out slum. No, not that bad. We were in a council flat. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to another part of London, which is where really my most happy memories are. And it's Finchley in North London. So I was eight years old. And uh, that's a big milestone in my life. So I can remember specifically things that happened from that date. And, and Finchley was a really nice area, quite similar to where I am now in Tokyo, actually, because mm. it was not too far from the center of London, but it had parks and little rivers. And there was even a dairy farm opposite my house across the main road. In there. Finchley? Yeah, and it's still there. There's still a dairy farm there? Yeah. With cows? Yep. Yeah. It's the express dairy. Wow. I later found out quite a lot of musicians lived around there, the Small Faces, the Kinks and quite a few others. When did you start getting into music then? When I was six, this is another milestone, when I was six my grandmother and grandfather moved to a beautiful big house in Broadstairs, which is by the sea mm -hmm. on the Kent coast. Mm. I loved it from the first day. I remember six years old going there and running up the stairs, which didn't have a carpet on yet. So I remember, even remember that noise, yeah. bang, bang, bang up the stairs. Yeah. And they had a really ropey old piano there. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen a piano before. And I, I went up to it and I was only little, so I put my hands and I banged it. I thought, that's fantastic. Yeah. It was completely out of tune, but I didn't mind. Yeah. And I banged it and banged it and within, a fairly short time, my mother had taught me a little bit on the piano because she played a bit. Mm -hmm. And she taught me a, a song which I'll never forget called La Mer by Charles Trenet, mm -hmm. which is one of the beautiful chansons. When I was eight or nine and we moved to Finchley, mum bought a proper piano. An upright, not a grand, of course, but it was in tune. Mm -hmm. And I thought, now I want to play properly. Can I have lessons, please? And there was no pressure. I think the lessons were fun. But then she'd give me homework, something to take home and do. Either I didn't practice much or I was, or I was so quick that I didn't have to practice much. Oh. But I remember, and this is a pattern that has not entirely left me even now. Yeah. Is I do, oh, 15 minutes to the lesson. I better practice now and I hadn't done anything all week and I could pull it off. Uh -huh. And then I was a bit cheeky because when I was 10, so that's just two years into the lessons, I said to my teacher, haven't you got anything more interesting? This is boring pieces you keep asking me to play, which were written by Bach, because mm. he wrote pieces for his daughter. And I remember this book called The Little Notebook of Anna Magdalena Bach. And it was things like dee, 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 very simple, yeah. sweet. But I found them boring. And she said, actually, there is uh, a course of children's lessons called Microcosmos by a Hungarian composer called Bartok, who was actually quite avant-garde. Mm -hmm. 
and I completely took to it like a duck to water because mm. you were doing strange harmonies, sort of Eastern sounding things and strange rhythms. So, you, you know, you, most music has three or four beats to the bar. This might have five or seven, just exotic things. And I loved it. So good old Sheila Carmichael, my teacher, who I'll never forget. Shout out to Sheila. Yeah, turn me <laughs> on to Bartok. Fun childhood. Perhaps like many people, the first six or seven years were the most affectionate, I mm. think. I think in a way, I could sense something wasn't all right at home. And I have a feeling that the music was a kind of comfort to me. It was a, it was a safe and peaceful and interesting world. And I didn't quite know why, but I think in retrospect, I had a sense that my mum and dad weren't getting on very well. Yeah. And as it turned out, they weren't. And by 16, dad had suddenly left to go off with someone else. Oh, I see. And exactly at 16, I started playing in bands. Ah. So things kind of come along when you need them. Yeah. We called ourselves the Soul Survivors. Later, we found out that there was an American band with the same name. They had a big hit called Expressway to Your Heart. I don't know if they had any other hits, but they heard about us. Once we'd made our first record, which we did when I was 17, mm -hmm. they must have read about it in the papers or something. And they sent our manager a letter a cease and desist letter saying, you've got to change your name. We're already famous. <laughs> so there was a, a, a romantic TV drama called The Love Affair on BBC television. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, that's a good name. And we yes. all thought, yeah, that'll do. Amazing. So when, after about a year, I was in The Love Affair. You obviously decided from that point on to kind of take on music as your career and take that on as your future. Mm. Sometimes it's quite difficult, I think, for parents of a certain generations to, yeah. to allow people to be artists or to follow music. It's quite frightening notion, or, or sports or yeah. dance. It's a quite frightening notion. What, what was their reaction to that? I just remember going into my mum's bedroom one night and saying, Mum, I want to leave school and be a professional full-time musician. And I really thought, I'm ready for this. And she said, no, you've got to stay and complete your schooling, get your A-levels, which is what they called it in those days, yeah. so that if you want to go to university, you can, you're qualified. The funny thing was that both my mum and my teachers, because I had school reports, you know, they said he has to decide between school and music, because they knew at school that I was a musician, as if I couldn't do both. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, that was rubbish, because mm -hmm. I knew I could do both, and I was doing both. And I wasn't tired. Come on, I was 17. Yeah. I wasn't tired. No. <laughs> but they all thought you can't do both. And what they were really saying is, he's got to do his studies. Here I went into a slump. And even then, I didn't give up hope. But um, it was one of the lowest points of my life because right. my pride and joy had been taken away from me. And so I really didn't do my homework with the enthusiasm that I used to because yep. I was enthusiastic and I like studying. Even with the lack of enthusiasm, I passed all four A-levels. Mm. During that year I was away, my band had a number one hit. Oh. Imagine, and they were on telly every week and here's me doing my math and nothing else. <laughs> oh, oh, Morgan, what's your takeaway from that? Well, how I look at it now and how I live my life now is really that I'm, a, I'm more of a floater. I go with the flow and I don't cause waves, but when I'm on something, I'm really on it. Yeah. So if someone does open the door and says, right, let's do this, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And it could be anything. That sort of floating with life and, and taking the rough with the smooth and accepting sadness as well as gladness. Mm. It somehow works for me. It seems more realistic. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think it affects the music I do, that, that, that I'm not aggressive, I don't want to be rich and famous, like a lot of people I know mm -hmm. did and succeeded. Mm. And you can hear it in the music, there's, there's, a, there's ambition and aggression, mm -hmm. which doesn't suit me so well. Yeah. I remember standing outside the Marquee Club, which is one of the most famous London rock clubs, yeah. in 67, and waiting to go see another band. And Love Affair all walked by, and there was, everyone's whispering, it's a love, it's a love affair, love, they're here. And, the, and they stopped by me and said, hello Morgan, how you doing, all right? And I said, yeah, all right, mate. And they were like really dressed in really cool, brightly coloured leather jackets, you know, I thought, well, this is going anywhere. They went on and everyone around me goes, oh, you know them? Wow. 
And I felt quite good about that. Yeah, I'm sure you did. So here's where one of my first big miracles comes along. Mm -hmm. So I asked my best friend at school, mm -hmm. can you write a letter to Love Affair? Just say, just thought you'd like to know Morgan's out of school now and he's like, he's free now. And there you go. And that simple message. And uh, he wrote it to them. And they wrote back and they actually said, do you want to come back? Because we don't really get on with the new guy we got in. Boom. Back in. Within a week, I was on television. I was a star. Fantastic. In a week. And then, when I was on television, Mum was telling her friends, my son was on television, you know. <laughs> so no problem there. I was all right So to she do. was, yeah, okay, I see. So then now that gave her permission to be okay with you doing what you were doing. Yeah, because I was making a few more. And I just really love that you kind of, you didn't just go, oh, I'm really shy, I'm not going to ask. But you got somebody else to do it for you. And I, uh, there's a real wisdom in that. And especially for the people who are viewing this, from a coaching perspective, it's like, find a way to do what you need to do. You don't have to always push through yourself. You can actually leverage other ways to do things. Ask for help from Ask people for help you trust. From people you trust. Very, yeah. very wise. So take us into the next kind of era of, of, of the Morgan Fisher story. Well, I mean, at first it was a number one, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we had about five more, and they were just a little bit lower every time. Yeah. But they were there in the top ten, yeah. so we could keep touring around Europe to big audiences. And it was still like Beatlemania in those days. If you've ever seen a Beatle concert, yeah. you can't hear the band because there's all that screaming. Uh huh. It was like that. And there's a row of security men pushing the girls back at the front of the stage continually. And then we get outside after the gig, and there'd be no security at all out the back. And we'd have to fight our way to our car yeah. through this crowd of clawing girls. Wow. And they'd pull your hair and pull your clothes. But of course it was exciting you know, yeah. to have that experience. And around that time, lots of amazing bands were coming up, which we all loved. Jimi Hendrix, Pink Floyd, you know, the more progressive, interesting side of rock was really flowering mm -hmm. in the mid to late 60s. So um, we wanted to sort of head that way. And I think most of the fans didn't know what the hell we were doing. They so you just went to hits. prog rock? We went to prog rock basically, yeah, and, and the fans just didn't get it. After about, how many years was it? 68 to 71. Just three years for very intense years. We decided to call it a day. And then I formed my own really prog rock band. And I couldn't think of a name, so I just called it Morgan. The singer was interesting because he impressed me very much with his voice and his songs. And I said, well, what, what have you been doing till now? And he said, well, I just was in a band called Smile. Oh, OK. Now, so early on, this is late 71. And he said, well, here's the drummer, Roger Taylor, and here's the guitarist, Brian May. And then one day I went to his kitchen and he said, oh, Morgan, here's the new singer in Smile. And there's this rather strange sort of Persian or something looking guy, all dressed in velvet who put out a floppy hand and went, hello, <laughs> I'm Freddie. <laughs> oh, hi, Freddie, all right. I didn't make much impression at that point. Yeah. So that's how far back my connection with Queen goes, is to before they were Queen. Right. And especially Brian used to come and see the Morgan Band nearly every time we played in London, so mm -hmm. he was a fan. And we made a couple of good albums, but we never really got off the ground. Mm -hmm. In fact, the second album, the record company said, we can't release this because you're not selling enough. So really, that was it. By that time, I was only 23, but I was already <laughs> feeling a bit jaded, like, well, uh, maybe that's it for me in the music business. Uh-huh. Because it had been five years of full-on solid work. So I just thought, well, I'll just get some odd job or something to pay me rent. I'm still living at home. I was paying rent. But I kept my eye on um, the Melody Maker, which is the main music magazine at that time. Yeah, yeah. And in the, on their back page, they had ads for bands seeking musicians. The first ad I tried, and it didn't say who they were, because if they're famous, they don't want to put the name because sure. they get besieged by fans. Yeah. So big name band, needs a keyboard player, um, and with an imminent American tour. And I thought, ah, never been to America. I like the sound of that. And this is not something I would advise everyone to do. But what happened was I got there half an hour early and it was a nice sunny afternoon in Chelsea. And next to the studio was 
an off license. <laughs> And I've never seen this before or since, but they were selling these little one glass sachets of wine. <laughs> I thought, well, that's perfect. I just had the one. I thought, well, I can't drink it out of the sachet. I'll probably spill it all over my shirt. So I said to the guy, do you mind if I borrow a glass? And he said, no, no problem. Which is probably completely against the law. Oh, yeah, because it's like you can't drink you. in the office. Yeah, license. yeah, sure, sure. But he didn't mind. So, yeah. just, so I opened it up, poured it in the glass, took one sip. And after one sip, the bass player who turned out to be Mott the Hoople, came in and said, oh, are you Morgan? And said, yeah. He said, can you come down to the studio now? I thought, well, I'll just walk in like this. You know? So you walked in with a glass of wine in, in your hand. I walked in with a glass, you know, suavely with a glass of red wine. Whereas probably most of the people who came in prior to me were like nervous and said, uh, my name's Bill, you know. And yeah. I just came and said, hi guys, what's up? You know? Yeah. And <laughs> I swear that's 50% of me getting the job. It just seems to weave together this story of this integrity and this authenticity throughout. So you joined Mott the Hoople. Tell me about that time. I mean, that was like real rock stardom, wasn't it? It was, and um, I'd seen them once before, but that was during my prog rock years, and I think I was musically a bit of a snob. I just looked and thought, it's basic rock, it's good, people seem to like it, whatever. And, uh, but when I got to play with them, and first of all, they're just a lovable bunch of guys. Not the hoople. Yeah. Seems like it now as oh, well, having sweethearts. watched your footage. And yeah. The tours were at a high level already, bigger than anything else I'd done. Probably double the size of anything Love Affair had done. Yeah. Plus um, enormous amounts of travelling in America because there's so much distance to cover mm -hmm. that you find yourself flying nearly every day, which is like, whoa, hey, you know. Yeah. I'm a yeah. jet setter now, whoa. <laughs> I, I realise how much you can do. That People have always said to me, that's too much. You can't handle all that. I bloody can. Yeah. And when I was 23, I must say I did drink a lot. I put a bottle of wine away before the gig, you know, yeah. just in the dressing room. Uh -huh. It's not easy. And then I'd take another bottle with me on the stage, put it in a nice bucket properly, yeah. and drink while I'm playing. Sophisticated. <laughs> Another thing I like to say is that some people say, well, you know, you think drinking sort of relaxes you and makes you play better, but actually you think you're playing better, but you're not really. And I have my trump card because I say, excuse me, have you heard the live album? It's still now considered one of the best live rock albums ever. Amazing. And I played things on that that I could never do just sitting here at home because mm -hmm. I was high on the audience. And if I'd had a few glasses as well, it didn't, make, didn't mess me up. It, yeah. it freed me up. In Everyone's a way. different. And again, I'm not recommending it to anybody. No. Nope. But when I look back, I played some serious good pianos during that, those tours. Yeah. Know? And I have the evidence. So. Yeah. And in America, they know how to show their enthusiasm much more than Brits. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Whoa, rock and roll, and they're on their feet immediately and stay on their feet for the whole show, you know. Amazing. And if, when you've got two to 5,000 people giving you that every night, you're just as high as a kite after the show. So you, you really responded bed. well to that? Oh, I've just... Yeah. Yeah? Fantastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the next chapter for you? Well, the band went through a couple of changes. The guitarist left, who I was living with, yeah. to form a band who did quite well, called Bad Company. <laughs> right? So we got someone else in, um, which is Ariel Bender, who is the guitarist that we... You have now. Have now. He's, he's wild, isn't he? Oh, he's a nutter. Yeah. yeah he's a I feel quite sorry for Ariel now when I think back. But another guitarist became available who our singer Ian Hunter had had his eye on for a long time. Another Mick, Mick Ronson who played with Bowie for several years. Mm -hmm. Not just played with him, he helped to arrange and produce and everything. He was a big influence on Bowie all through the Ziggy Stardust era. Okay. So absolutely brilliant guitarist, a beautiful looking man, yeah. great dresser. He, he had it all, you know. Yeah. And when he became available, I, I mean, I didn't decide it, but Ian Hunter just said, right, we're getting him in. I'm sorry, Ariel. See you later. How does that affect the dynamics of a group? I mean, even I can see you still now feel a little bit sad about that. Like, uh, a bit no, like, I do, but, you know, we got our tour manager to tell him. Okay. None of us could tell him. <laughs> Especially our singer, who's the one that had decided it. And um, we sent him off to do the deed. But it's nice to know that like things cycle back and that you are all mates now. There's a word in Japanese I love to use and it's 
initially I thought it was only applied to music and it's about up and down, mm -hmm. light and shade as we say. Mm. And it's Medi Harry. Medi Harry. And it even sounds nice. Yeah. It sounds like a bloke called Harry who's merry. But, <laughs> but the Medi Harry is like the up and down, Medi yeah. Harry, Medi Harry. So light and shade and that's the essence of life. Really. Most certainly yeah. is. Most certainly is, Morgan. We'd also been working with this new young band who were challenging us a bit, called Queen. They who, supported you, right? They supported us 20 times in England and 20 times in America. So we got to know them I quite just, well. I have to get my head around that because like, I'm just talking to you and it's like, Queen supported you. <laughs> in those days, we do 20 gigs and have maybe two days off. The, the, you know, the scheduling was bonkers, vicious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but again, we didn't mind. Yeah. 23, 24. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Get on with it. On the last night of that tour, that British tour, it was in London, and um, we had a couple of special visitors who came down. David Bowie and Mick Jagger came to see us play. Apparently, at that time, there was a bit of a scandal going on. Where are they having a fling? Yeah getting into their bias. Oh, thing. how fabulous. So they were I'm not against that idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone said to me, you know, well, that Mick Jagger, he never did that again, did he? I've never heard of him mm -hmm. trying it. And I thought, yeah, but he certainly picked a good one, didn't he, to do it with, yes, if, he did, if he did it. For sure. And when, they, uh, when we played, I was at the far right of the stage, as I nearly always am. And just behind me, I'm literally six feet behind me, those two were dancing arm in arm. Mm -hmm. The whole show. Mm. And I was like, I was, I wouldn't say I was nervous, but I thought I'd better play good tonight. So we were all set then to do a really big American tour, including Madison Square Gardens. We were just on the up, and then suddenly our singer called up uh, our bass player and said, um, "I can't do it anymore. I've had a kind of breakdown." Mm. And the doctor says, "I mustn't tour." Mm -hmm. And within a very short time, not only the tour was off but the band was off. And so how did you manage this one? We were numbed as, as they like to, as people like to say we were shocked and stunned you know. And you never thought like to bring in another singer? We did. Oh? Oh yeah very quickly we mm -hmm. thought well let's keep going and we'll shorten the name to Mott and find another singer. So we did who was completely different to Ian Hunter which we wanted. Yeah. We didn't want a copycat and we did that and made two albums but it never really took off. And this would be a 75, 76. And just about then, punk was coming up. And punk musicians were being very, uh, well, they were saying anything before punk is rubbish. It's dinosaurs or it's old farts. Mm -hmm. But then we got another singer in and did two more albums. We changed the name of the band to British Lions. And this singer was a very good songwriter, so we made some really good albums. And somehow we keep it going, you know, um, yeah. until the British Lion's second album was, again, I had this experience of the record company not wanting to release it because it wouldn't sell enough. So then another band went down, yeah. down the pan. And so how were you feeling at this point? And how do you kind of Well, come back by then that? I'd spent about five years on a roll with Mott the Hoople and the following bands. But I could see the... Um, the problems in dealing with major record companies because basically they're pressuring you to have hit, hit after hit after hit, mm -hmm. which is fair enough because that's how they survive. Yeah. I wasn't enjoying that pressure anymore, especially when it wasn't working. So I yeah. thought, there's got to be another way. And I was totally inspired by the punk's do-it-yourself attitude. Mm -hmm. And this, this do-it-yourself attitude permeated England at that time and, and totally inspired me. Mm -hmm. I didn't suddenly want to form a punk band. Yeah. Although I did play with one or two, which mm -hmm. was loads of fun. Yeah. But I wanted to go indie. And by that time, the technology of making a studio in your bedroom, which is now everywhere, all over the world, mm -hmm. had just become available. It wasn't, it wasn't computers yet or any of that, but there were smaller tape recorders which were good enough quality to make a record in your bedroom. So I managed to buy a system like that. And I had a little flat in Notting Hill Gate and I went in there and I felt like I want to be like an artist. I want to go into a room, make something and come out and say, look, all my own work. Uh -huh. Which means I'd written the song, I'd played it, I'd sung it, I'd recorded it, mixed it, designed the album cover, everything myself. And Amazing. I did that. 
and I found a friend who was starting, he wanted to start a record label, something like that, where you don't have to have big hits and big budgets. He encouraged young artists to make it on the DIY level, but he would help with the distribution, so he would get it into shops nationwide, which is a great attitude, because you know, most musicians don't know how to do that bit. Yes, of course not. But he did, because he'd been working for big record companies, so he had all those contacts. So it was a really good relationship we had. And I remember him saying to me one day, whatever you record, I'll release it and I'll distribute it. So it's complete carte blanche, complete freedom, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And I spent a couple of years, really creative, busy years. I made four of my best albums in my whole life. And there's then, your integrity and authenticity again. Very quickly, I made one album. I mean, the other albums I basically played myself, but one album, it was actually after he'd said to me, you can do anything you want and I'll release it, because he'd already released a couple and he liked what I did. So I sat down at home and I wrote a list of all the people I like to collaborate with. I thought, next record, I'll get someone really interesting to work with. And the list got longer and longer and longer until it filled the whole page. Mm. And I thought, I can't choose, I can't choose. I'm sure they're all available one way or another. So why don't I just get them all on one album? <laughs> Meaning, everyone gets one minute to do whatever they want. Very simple concept. I actually put my money where my mouth was in, in a funny way by buying little reels and putting a minute of blank tape on there and sending the reel to each artist. Mm -hmm. Most of them didn't even have their own studios, but I thought it's nice. It's a nice way of presenting the project rather than just a letter. They, see, they can see I mean what I'm doing. Yeah. Here's a bit of tape, fill it up. Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing happened out of this project on zero budget. Yeah. You know? But I just went around meeting all these amazing people and collecting all these one minute pieces. And I called the album Miniatures and just put it out. I used to like inviting different kinds of people mm -hmm. to parties and say, right, get on with each other. And so you'd see Brian May talking to some young punk with a safety film. Yeah. You know, that was great, they were all getting on, Isn't that nice, you know. And uh, the last time I did it was in my flat, my studio flat. And uh, it was just fate, I think. It was getting louder and louder and madder and madder. And there was people dancing and all the lights were out. And the, the speakers started to break up and distort. It was like Armageddon, like everything was going <laughs> and then the, the massive noise and everything. And I suddenly got the feeling, I need to get out of here, I need to go away. What do I need to do? I don't know. I need to make space for something. So I'm going to go to a hotel and check out of my own party. <laughs> and in fact, I think I'll go to the Ritz Hotel. Because I feel something's, something's coming, something good. I don't know what it is. Oh, I love that wait. <laughs> You, you went to the best I, 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 You can feel something. Okay, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about this in Big Magic, when you can feel something coming in and you have to give it the space to start. And it's like, wow, okay, so you knew what you were doing there. You had to give it the space to start and to give it the space to come well, through. Well, I mean, and I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew that I had to get out and do this thing. Yeah. Um, and honour something. Honour it. And do it properly. Mm-hmm. And, and I woke up, you know, and I just thought, right, that's it, I'm going to India, possibly forever. And I called my best friend who was running this record company, who I, you know, who'd given me the, all this carte blanche. Mm -hmm. In fact, he'd helped me with the whole thing, vegetarianism, meditation. He got me involved in all that as well. So this one mm -hmm. guy came along, and, you know, changed my life, basically. Mm -hmm. But I was ready. That's the point, you've got to be ready. What, what, what would you say, people who have got something for you or who are going to give mm. you a sign, they're around all the time but you've got to be ready for them. Tell me more about that. I remember one time I was staying in a farmhouse um, very close to Mount Fuji by myself for a few months. A friend had just lent it to me and I thought I'd give it a go. And um, an artist I know, living, a Japanese artist living in... Tokyo sent me a postcard and he said, I've just become part of this charity project for, for blind children. And it's being led by a blind artist. And I thought, wait a minute, a blind artist? Mm. And there was his art on the postcard. I'm tearing up now. Oh. <laughs> 
it was beautiful, you know, I just thought, whoa, this guy who's like, could be a tragic cripple, is helping other people. And uh, I just went to the piano and I wrote a song. And it just happened like that, you know. Beautiful. And, uh, and maybe I've been ready for it because I was, I'd taken the space to get away from busy Tokyo. So, this just a postcard and it just went st like an arrow yeah. to my heart. Opened something up. And it's one of the greatest songs I've ever written. Oh. And uh, that's not the first time either that something's happened, you know. I love this. It's like, oh my God, it's really, it's just, yeah, it's like real artists like yourself, real writers, real people who live in that complete integrity. Oh, wait. Oh, God, I'm just having a moment. Kyle, it's you and me. It happened to you and me. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just talking to my videographer now. Right? Okay. <laughs> oh, leave that in. <laughs> All right, so it's like when these things kind of happen and you come together, it's like, wow, okay, you just have to be ready for them and just show up for them. Oh, mate, thank you. That is just gorge, gorge, gorge. I'm oh, right, the, so you've in you're, in the, you're in the Ritz. I'm in the Ritz. You decide so to go breakfast. I've, yeah. breakfast. I've decided I'm going to India now. And then I call my friend up, who's influenced me so much, who run this Indies record company. And mm -hmm. I said, would you like to have supper with me at the Ritz? And he said, well, not, I don't really feel like going out today. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. I've made the decision I'm going to India mm -hmm. as soon as possible. And he said, ah, all right, let's mm -hmm. celebrate. So he came and uh, we all both had to wear a tie. I said, you've got to wear a tie. <laughs> and we came and we went to the main restaurant there, which is incredible. And we did the full thing right down to the cigars and brandy at the end. And then I got back to the apartment what a mess, what a mess it was. I can imagine. <laughs> and I had to clean all that up and I thought, wait a minute, there's, life has its responsibilities, there's physical things you've got to handle. Exactly. So I said, right, I'm going to give myself three months to tie up my loose ends and then I'm going to India. I was quite surprised how adult, behaving is not my usual way. Just about gathered enough money to make a, a long trip to India, including selling basically everything I had. Yeah. I started taking a few records out, thinking I don't really need that one or that one, and eventually they were all gone. All 5,000 LPs were all gone. Oh I didn't God. miss them at all. Yeah. I thought I could always buy them again later. And then I started selling the instruments. That was the big let go. Mm -hmm. You mean I'm, not, I'm selling my tools as well? Yeah. Yeah, why not? I've been working hard for by that time, 10 straight years, working full on, really without a vacation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let them go, because you can always buy them again. So I did, and uh, so I decided to finance my free time. It was my sabbatical, if you like, Yeah. with an open end. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo!